What's up guys? It's Q&A time on February 4th, 2019. Uh, I have a bit of a cold this week, a little congestion, so I sound kind of muffled. Um, we will get it done nonetheless. Uh, today was open Q&A, so all kinds of different questions, and we'll dive right into it on Facebook. <clears throat> Switching an athlete from off-season to prep, have you dealt with stubborn fat loss off the start? Um, cutting calories or how did you uh, get it going? Um, yeah, so sometimes people just adapt quickly off the start. You know, they might, you might start a fat loss phase and they just metabolically, they just adapt pretty quick right off the rip and you have to drop a little bit harder. Um, some people naturally, they don't adapt. You know, you, we think of metabolic adaptions like, um, something that happens later in prep, you know, something that happens or later in a fat loss phase when they're a lot leaner and calories are a lot lower, but that's not necessarily true. I mean, sometimes it takes a little while to get those fat loss gears turning. And I've had people that have had to make multiple changes to really get it moving. So <clears throat> if you are running into that type of person, you might want to just drop them harder right off the, you know, right off the bat to get things moving. Um, and normally they're feeling better, you know, feeling good at that point, everything's functioning pretty good and they should have enough calories in the, you know, in the piggy bank there build up in the off season that, that you can pull a little bit harder if you need to. So yeah, that's not, I would say that's super uncommon. It's not like you don't just pull out 200 calories and the people just automatically start dropping. And two, another thing to keep in mind too, is that their metabolic flexibility is so high and that they're and they're metabolically a little bit more adaptive to subtle changes because they are eating so much so if they're eating 5,000 calories and you pull down to 4,800 is their body really going to notice that much probably not so just keep that in mind um <clears throat> what do you think about starting a prep and being very aggressive for a few weeks to get leaner we just talked about that uh, drop water and improve sensitivity and then switching to a smaller, more sustainable deficit to get a bit of a recomp effect during the diet. Would this work in an enhanced individual? Uh, would they recomp? I mean, maybe, maybe not. They might. I wouldn't, I wouldn't even focus so much on the recomping as, as the actual premise of the question, like drop, should they drop harder off the bat and then drop to a sustainable deficit? Um, you know, PEDs aside, it's, you know, the recomping thing is going to be very individual and depending on how they respond. But, um, yeah, you could. And I mentioned an instance above to where you might want to do that, where you might want to drop a little bit harder right off the bat. That would be a case where you would definitely do so. Um, when they do have that kind of adaptable metabolism or a lot of metabolic flexibility and you just need to get things moving. Um, especially if, if someone's calories are really, really high at the beginning, it's not like they, they have a lot of cushion, so it's not a terrible idea to just go ahead and get it moving. And as I said above too, they, I mean, they, they tend to feel good. Everything's functioning good. I would rather move the pace a little bit quicker early on if I can, rather than trying to push for two pounds a week of fat loss or something when someone's already, you know, half dead. So yeah, I don't think it's a bad idea at all with a lot of people. Um... Regarding digestion, off-season prep, or a person that doesn't do shows, uh, would you recommend digestive digestion supplements to be used year-round or periods with and without them? And then they said, <clears throat> reason I ask is from my own experience, I was taking a lot of digestive supplements, enzymes, ox bile, betaine, and cut it down literally just to Nutrigen, which is a morphogen nutrition product which has some digestive aids in it, uh, and apple cider vinegar. Same amount of calories, same routine foods I've been having. Training's the same, no other variables change. Midsection is more watery and soft since cutting those out. It even face at times looks a little more rounded. Desk job is a big contribution to water and food sitting in the stomach, but would you say keeping the digestive aids in would be a good idea? Yes, I mean, if you need if you need these things, you're deficient in these things and you need them. I mean, that's it is what it is. It's uh, and certain things are going to be more important in certain instances, like um, you might not need ox bile in a low-fat diet, whereas it you know, helps with bile production. 
you might not need betaine in a really low calorie diet uh, because you have enough stomach acid to digest the food. Um, so, I mean, there's context to it, but I mean, if you need them, you need them. That's it. You know, it's not that you're doing any damage by taking them long term, like, especially not the things you're talking about. I mean, it's not like um, if they help, they help use them usually means you're deficient or you're eating an amount of food that your body doesn't particularly like to process and you need some extra assistance but yeah I mean there's no I mean in general most of the supplements there's no harm in taking them long term I mean we're not talking about like antimicrobial type digestive supplements and things like that that are like severely altering gut uh, microbiome so yeah these like betaine for example is fine you can use it all the time. Uh, a lot of people need to. Actually, can help with methylation as well. Um, ox bile, yeah, or, or like I use D limonene with some people for more bile production. So, I mean, any of those, they're fine. Um, I would just add them back in and see how you feel. And if you feel better again, then you know some of that water drops off. Then I would I would say that's probably a sign that you need them. <coughs> all right. If a body part isn't responding, how would you know if you're doing too much or still not enough? Stubborn body parts. Okay, so, um, well, first I would definitely look at recovery, you know. I mean, are you recovering well? Are you progressing on that body part? Especially if it's like a body part where you're doing compound lifts, like your back, for example. Uh, or it's a big muscle group, a lot of small muscle groups within there, or your your quads, or something like that. I mean, if you're not making any progress on your compound lifts, and there's, you know, maybe you're not recovering, or something in your program is enable, you know, is uh, holding you back from recovering and progressing. Um, you know, if it's your biceps, so well, you're probably not gonna, you know, progress a whole lot on bicep curls. Uh, if you're doing, and how, so how would you know? Uh, try it. I would just try it. I mean, unless you're in some kind of major rush, I would go through periods of, I would go through periods of frequency and then lower frequency or, or lower, you know, frequency and volume, and see how you feel with it and see how they look and progress. Uh, but unless you're like grossly overtraining it and it's just not recovering and they're sore often or they're just feel sluggish and and not connecting very well in the gym or they are like don't look like they almost look worse like uh, just from uh, being chronically inflamed because you're training them too much you're not getting good pumps in there um, that might be a sign you're doing too much but if it's just like if it's just a subtle difference then you're probably not going to notice anything and I would suggest just trying both ways um, all right <coughs> All right, so on Instagram, taking GH, six IUs, training to two IUs off versus four IUs daily. Basically the same, okay, yeah. It's basically the same total. Would you see any difference? Uh, well, probably not in all reality. You probably wouldn't see any difference. Depending on like you know how are you splitting it? If you took the six total and you split it up into maybe three doses throughout the training day, morning, pre workout, night, something like that, into you know two, 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 it's probably a good bet. Or you could do the two off uh, and then go pre or I'm sorry, and then morning and uh, pre on the training days for the four. So no, I highly doubt you would notice any difference. To be honest, in the grand scheme. All right, let's see. Uh, someone normally, for someone that normally does post-workout hit cardio for 15 to 20 post-workout three times a week, now they're incorporating post-workout insulin with their carbs and protein meal 30 minutes post-workout. Is there any interference with fat loss and metabolic effects of hit cardio if insulin is used shortly afterwards? No. And I'll tell you why. <laughs> uh, well, first off, HIT cardio is not, or HIT cardio is more glucose intensive than something like steady states. I mean, you're, 
if you release glucose, your body's going to release insulin. And if you're eating carbs afterwards, then your body's going to, you know, release endogenous insulin. So if you're taking it exogenously, it doesn't make any difference. I mean, it's, it's still there. It's there one way or the other. So your effects are the same, essentially. And you know, if you were using something that to release free fatty acids like growth hormone or yohimbine, and you're doing a non-glucose intensive cardio, like steady state, low intensity, uh, like in the morning or something, and then we're, t- then we're talking about a different scenario. But in this scenario, no, won't make any difference. Still going to burn the same amount of total calories. You know, energy expenditure is going to really rule all at the end of this. Okay. Uh, we got one more, maybe. Let's see. Is there any research on if exogenous ketone supplementation is harmful for someone not in ketosis? My dad's partner likes to go to uh, weight loss section at GNC and take anything that they have there. Uh, he started to take exogenous ketone gummies and he is most definitely not following any sort of keto protocol. <laughs> LOL. Okay. <coughs> no, it wouldn't hurt anything. Uh, it's just the ketones are just providing a different fuel source for the brain. Um, I actually posted about this a while ago when ketones were kind of coming out. You know, I've, they died off some, but uh, there was some cool, the, this cool experiment I saw was a cyclist and he was having carbs in his diet. Like, you know, he had, he was having carbs uh, normally and then he was taking ketones. What he was noticing is his blood sugar was actually dropping. His brain was, his brain and his body were, um, had preferred to use the ketones as an energy source, which was really interesting. So ketones are a pretty readily available energy source, especially for the brain. Like it, it will utilize them pretty readily. That's why a lot of people notice they give like better focus and they just feel better. Not, you know, not as foggy and stuff. Um, and well, <laughs> So no, the answer is no, it's not going to hurt anything. But the real fault in this is that they aren't going to help with fat loss directly. I mean, they're not going to do anything for fat loss directly. They just, they, and in fact, they have calories, ketones have calories. So, I mean, they're, they're just adding calories to the diet. Now, if you were doing some kind of ketosis or some kind of like diet where calories were super low and you want a little extra energy source, ketones would be a really good option without adding a bunch of extra carbs. Um, But in this case, he, he may actually just be adding calories to the diet that he doesn't need. So, yeah, I would, I would maybe l- let him know <laughs> that he might actually be making himself lose less weight. Okay. All right. Hmm. Uh, well, there's one more. I'll touch on it real briefly. I'm running out of time, but I'll, I'll just touch on it a little bit. Um, metformin. Metformin for longevity. Uh, they asked about that. So, yeah, it does have some anti-aging properties. Uh, there's actually, I think I posted something about this where it was approved. And, and don't quote me on this, but I think it was approved by the FDA as an anti-aging type of treatment or, or something in that regard. And it actually had been being used in several other countries for a long time. So we were kind of way behind the curve, but uh, yeah, because it's typically used as like a diabetes oral diabetes medication um, to help lower hepatic glucose output primarily. But it also has some anti-aging like um, it's play in the IGF feedback loop. Like that's a big one lowering IGF potentially. So, I mean, um, raising AMPK, so yeah, I mean, there's, there's definitely some properties that it has, uh, it maybe I'm saying maybe because I haven't seen it on blood work, but some people say that it can actually do some harm to the kidneys, uh, long-term use. So, I mean, I would just keep an eye on blood work, but I, I truthfully haven't seen it. Even someone that was prescribed it for a really long time, no issues, but you know, maybe something to look out for, but yeah. For sure. Uh, so they asked about cancer, brain degradation. Yeah, I mean, yeah, potentially, especially the IGF and the cancer. I mean, you're talking about especially like people that have cancer already. Um, 
versus people getting cancer. It's still two really different things. So keep that in mind. But yep, pretty good, pretty good uh, option there. Um, I, I might have to, if you have any more questions on it, let me know. I know I have that article on my my Facebook somewhere and I can always tag you in it and you can check it out. So thanks guys. Uh, that brings us to the end of this Q&A um, and I will talk to you guys next week.